all my uh, Star Wars knowledge is irrelevant now. I'm sure all you know. So, if you need to have any talk about obsolete Star Wars books, we can do that later. Hey guys, um, I'm thrilled to be back in uh, in Europe. This is uh, my second time speaking over here, my second time in France. I love it. Uh, Leon's amazing. Uh, yesterday I had a salad that was covered in meat. Like, I couldn't even see the, the lettuce part. Ah, it was incredible. Um, so, it, this this town knows how to get to me. Um, so I work at HashRocket. Uh, we're a consultancy of about 30 people, um, mostly developers. We have a small design team. And I write front-end code. I wireframe with clients. I do UX, UI, all sorts of things. So I work with developers all the time. And what this talk is about is moving from design to development, moving from pixels to code, helping developers communicate better with designers and be more flexible in their process uh, on both sides to make everyone's life easier, hopefully. So. Let's go. Uh, let's start at the beginning of a little bit of process talk uh, and look at user-centered design as um, we, most of us know it. Um, there's an analysis phase, right? You've got to you gather requirements. You learn a little bit about uh, what needs to happen in a particular application. You've got an IA UI UX phase. Uh, you've got a design phase where things look nice, and an implementation phase where things work right, and then you deploy. So that's very basic. Uh, this even looks kind of waterfall. Uh, a newer way to look at this that a lot of people are, have moved to, including us, uh, to a degree, um, is uh, an analysis phase, UI, UX, information architecture, uh, design, make things look nice, implement, make things work right, and then, but there's a deployment happening as soon as possible. Like things are getting in front of a client as soon as possible. Uh, instead of waiting until something is completely 100% polished and feature complete, you're moving it into a client's hands sooner. So this is, I mean, this is this is rapid prototyping, uh, and it's a it's a strong trend, and it has been for a while. Um, but this still doesn't match up to what I feel like is a really healthy process uh, for HashRocket and probably for a lot of you as well. And there are some reasons for that. So rapid prototyping is cool. Getting stuff out sooner is cool, but uh, there are some problems. Uh, clients, clients also have clients. So what that means, oh, well, first of all, let's define what a client is. Some of you guys might not work at consultancies, so you think, I don't have clients, you know, this doesn't apply to me. Well, everyone has a client. You have someone who has to look at what you've done and understand it, and you have to justify it to them. So if I'm, as a designer, even if I'm designing like a, a homepage for uh, one of the guys at HashRocket doing an open source project, um, they're my client, and I have to talk to them, and I have to understand their needs, and I have to give something to them. Even if you're just designing a gem with an API, your clients are other developers that are using that API. You still have people that you have to communicate with. And a lot of the time, those people have people that they have to communicate with, too. So perhaps you're a team of designers, developers, um, and you have users. That's a perfect scenario of you get to talk directly to your users, you're delivering code, uh, and, and do interfaces directly to them, you're learning directly from them. This is rare um, for most of us. Uh, there's a client in between. So you're giving something to a client and they have users if you work at a consultancy or even if you're just giving stuff to other members of a larger product team or something like that. So you can't talk directly to the users. Um, maybe there's a customer that the client has. So the client is actually selling their software to other people, or maybe it's being white labeled, or there's, or say that like uh, the client signs up other people uh, to like a, a CRM software or project management. There's another layer of users farther away from you, uh, and maybe you're working for a giant organization that has prior de uh, prior design. They have a legal team that stuff has to be run by. I mean, you're getting farther and farther away from the final people that have to use your thing. And so the rapid prototyping can break down because you are delivering something that doesn't represent the final product in ways that are becoming increasingly hard to justify the farther you get away from the people that are going to be using it. So for, for us at HashRocket, this just means that we try to design a, a complete fleshed out design sooner and make things look polished, make things represent properly. So there, there, there are other ways to explain this. So clients, they might have clients. The food chain can be very long. Uh, clients don't necessarily understand partial design. So 
if I'm, and this happened, it used to happen to me all the time before I stopped doing this. As a designer, I might deliver a mock-up to a, a client that has like a, the sidebar isn't done. We haven't decided what's going to go in the sidebar. So I like gray it out or something or, you know, it's, it's, it's supposed to be ignored <laughs> in some way. The design, the, inevitably the client on the other side, non-technical or otherwise maybe, is going to be distracted by that. They're going to say, you know, what, what's going on with the side, like, or, or they send it off to somebody. Remember how many steps that you might be removed from the people looking at this? And they, they're like, oh, they have some feedback. They're wondering what's up with the sidebar, you know, that kind of stuff. So they might not understand that. And uh, a, a good way to, uh, to illustrate this is um, using, actually, an illustration that's supposed to be for the opposite reason. It's supposed to justify rapid prototyping, and I don't think it does it very well. Um, so consider the hammer. So say you're, uh, whoops, say you're, um, you're designing a hammer for a client. Um, so if, if you're designing the hammer, do you just want to draw it on a piece of paper and then get them to just uh, get them to approve and sign off on you producing the hammer just from a drawing? Uh, do you want to cut out that pa paper hammer from uh, the piece of paper and have the client hold it and kind of imagine what it would be like to use the hammer? And they're like, oh, that's, that seems pretty good. I could probably hammer with this. Um, you know, here's your money. Um, or should you produce a hammer in styrofoam because that's quick and easy and then test it like that? Or um, should you produce the actual hammer you want to sell and have the client try and hammer nails with it? So obviously you want to do the fourth thing here. Um, and this is in an article that's, uh, this is, example is from an article that is trying to justify um, delivering rapidly and designing more later, like polishing the design later. Um, here, the problem with this is that unless you've decided how the hammer looks and like what the client's impression of the hammer is really going to be, this is your minimum viable product of a hammer. You're going to deliver something that functions perfectly as a hammer. Maybe it's the exact material, it's been machined properly, it has the right weight and heft and everything, but it doesn't look like a hammer, it, doesn't, it isn't what's actually going to be used. You're like, well, this is my minimum viable product of a rapidly prototyped hammer, and we'll figure out the, the polish and the design details later after we get it into users' hands. Well, a lot of the times your users aren't going to want to use this. And um, if you're working for clients like we do, or e even if you're justifying things within your own team, you're, you're, you're hurting yourself. You're making your com the conversation harder to have because there are things here that aren't done, and it's hard to explain to someone what they should be accepting and what they should be understanding should be done later. Um, so clients don't understand partial design. I, th I found this to be true over many years, and I haven't really found any, any uh, reason to uh, change my opinion on that. Um, and UX doesn't end. Like, the process of user e experience uh, is something that I, I it, is a, it is its own field. Um, obviously, there are people who, who do that all the time. But the, the language of understanding users' experience and the ability to think about that stuff is something that I think is the responsibility of everyone involved in producing a product. Um, so I, 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 like, I tell the guys at HashRocket that I want to hear back from them as people using it and as people in the business domain of the product. And the, there are a lot of user experience is just paying attention, it's common sense, and it's communication, and everyone should be involved in that process. So when we look back at this revised UCD chart, um, these are all from um, Thomas Peterson, by the way, a couple of years ago. Um, you've got your analysis, your UI, UX, your design, your implementation, and then this deployment cycle. I don't feel like this matches up realistically with what um, we do at HashRocket, and it might not match up with what you do or need to be doing um, because of, of the things that we just talked about. Like, I, I hate that UX ends in this other process. Like, there's, it's some magic that only happens at a certain early point in a project. Um, so at HashRocket, um, this is kind of how I, I work out how, how we do things. Um, at first, we'll wireframe and story card with a client. Um, so we'll sit down and we'll actually wireframe on the same screen as the story cards, we have the wireframes on two-thirds of the screen and story cards on the other third. Are you guys familiar with story cards, by the way? Is that pretty, anyone not familiar with story cards? Just make sure, one guy. So st uh, we're breaking down, just for you. So, we're, um, so when we story card, we just try to break everything down into the minimum feature requirement. So uh, like if, if you're uh, looking at an index of products, uh, you want your first story might just be that you see the product name uh, alpha in a certain order, and then the next story might be that you would see the image properly at the proper size. 
that sort of thing. So everything gets broken down into little stories, and the wireframes are being built by the designer at the same time on the same screen so everyone can visualize um, together. So you're gathering your features and you're having your conversations visually and functionality-wise all at one time. Um, then this gets handed off to a designer for look and feel. And this is when myself or one of the other designers takes either um, some time to develop new branding or we work with an existing branding. But the point is that we, by the time we get out of a look and feel process for a specific view in the app, that view looks like it's going to look in the application. And we can deliver a complete idea to the client and get their approval of that before anything gets implemented. And then finally, uh, implement and deploy. And then this is the most important part, and this is what most of this talk is going to be about, this phase. As soon as something needs to change, we need to be able to flexibly react. That information needs to come into our team. We need to be able to change uh, what needs to be changed quickly, and the designers and developers need to be able to be flexible. Because, I mean, we say we're agile at HashRocket. We say that we can do this stuff and prioritize flexibility. So we need to be able to do that. So what I, what I want you guys to take away from this is that you need to be delivering to communicate. Uh, and for what that means for us is that we need published deliverables at HashRocket. And it's possible that a published deliverable will help you at your job uh, and help you with your own designers and, and just help everyone's process. So, in this, so what I want to talk about next is um, how, the, uh, how we deliver that stuff and how we hand things off from expertise to expertise. So if you have this process of uh, moving something from an idea or a wire, you know, a wireframe, a conversation, into pixels, into actual working code. You know, you've got so, no matter wh who you work for, someone is coming up with an idea. You know, maybe it's idea guys, and you're just dealing with it, or maybe it's you with the client. You know, who knows? Uh, you've got a designer, and even if you don't have a designer, something's desi somebody's designing something. So maybe you are designing it. You're, there is a designer, um, and then obviously a developer is implementing the stuff. Um, but these are really deliverables. And, and so your initial deliverable is going to be a wireframe or a sketch or something rough. Uh, your designer might be dis putting a, together a PSD or a sketch file or, or s even static markup um, if you go straight there. You're going to have somebody doing the actual front end. And then you're going to have a developer doing Ruby or, or what have you. Um, but this might be you. I mean, your process might be this crazy. Um, because these are all, you know, like I said before, these are all potentially completely separate um, expertise. So you might have a UX designer at your job doing a wireframe, a UI designer uh, doing a PSD or doing like components. I mean, there can be a lot of phases in this process, more than we use, definitely. You might have another designer who's actually the production designer who's like taking the components and putting them into a page together. You might have somebody else completely doing all of the front end stuff, and you might have somebody else doing, doing the actual development. And that might be you. You know, you, you could easily be step five of this chain of handoffs. And so, really, this chart is, um, whoops, oh no, now I gotta go through the chart again. Um, so this chart has these gaps, and that's not really what's happened. The, I mean, things, things don't just magically pass from one expertise to the next. Um, there's really some overlap here, and uh, this overlap is what I like to call a handoff. So at some point, and somebody's expertise needs to become, that they need to deliver something to somebody else, who, and their expertise is something different. Oh, excuse me. Um, so in HashRocket, uh, when I first started, our process looked something like this. Um, and this, is, this was overwhelming to come into. So I, I walked into HashRocket, um, was basically told, hey, there's a backlog. Go do anything tagged with design. Uh, <laughs> and I just started doing stuff. Um, and so what I found out is our, as we started, as we, uh, and we've refined this process over the years, but at first, uh, the designer would wireframe directly with the client. In a separate session, without the designer present, the developers would use the wireframes as a reference to write all the stories with the client. Um, and then the designer would then take uh, the reference his own wireframes and the stories uh, to make the PSDs, uh, hand it off to a dedicated front-end person who would do some of the JavaScript and like stub out Ajax requests and things like that. And then the developer would, would finish up the JavaScript and write the Ruby. Um, so you have two pretty major handoff points here um, that were a lot of trouble. And then this really disconnected wireframing and story carding thing, which isn't really the subject of this talk, but it was really scary <laughs> as, a, as a designer um, because you're not, you're not there. You're not ha you don't have someone in the room, one of you guys, like justifying decisions and things like that. Um, so, but these two handoff points were really difficult. So 
the designer is writing some of the front end markup. Maybe the the front end guy is writing the rest. Um, but this process, I mean, I, I can tell you a lot of a lot of designs fall apart right there because if your designer doesn't write code or if they at the very least don't understand code, they can very easily design something that's a huge pain in the ass to actually slice. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. Or or like or something that doesn't like float properly on the page or requires too many images or it's just difficult to maintain. Um, like fancy buttons that need images and stuff like that. Um, and so you, that handoff point is real pain. And then the uh, front end to the developer handoff um, is, is a constant, it can be a constant pain because of the JavaScript, because of the nature of uh, making sure that all of the states are properly represented and things like that. And the designer, again, if in circuit 2010, the designer wasn't involved with a lot of that step. So this is how it looks for us today. Um, our wireframes are done with the whole team, uh, with the story carding and everything. So the deliverable out of that is wireframe and story cards. The designer um, is involved with that, does all of the, the mockups. Uh, actually, we have our, our designer slice all the HTML and CSS and are responsible for it for the duration of the project. Um, there's a handoff point where the developer takes that markup and then implements it and writes the vast majority of the JavaScript. And so we have some tools and stuff that I'm going to show you that, that facilitate this process because this wireframe and story card looking, look and feel step and then implementation and deploying and then being able to react back backwards, that's what that corresponds to this. Like the ability, we want to be able to react backwards, back through the HTML and CSS, go back to the PSD if we absolutely have to, although we try not to. This talk is called More Code, Fewer Pixels because he, Photoshop is a bad place to iterate design. It's a great place to come up, or for people who use it, um, like myself, it's a great place to come up with initial design but it's a, it's a tough place to, to change things quickly. Um, so we react backwards through this process. I mean, this is how I think of it. So as you move from an idea to pixel to code, you should recognize your expertise and facilitate those handoff points. Yours might look different than mine, but at some point, somebody is responsible for something and they have to give it to someone else. So, um, and you, you need to find out who is good at both all of those things. I was talking with um, somebody yesterday who was saying that uh, they have, you know, s they, they feel pretty comfortable with writing CSS, so they do some of it. And they were asking if that happens at HashRocket. And the answer is no. Like, our, our, we want to make sure that the person who, uh, the person who has the most expertise in that area has the freedom to control that area because it makes the handoff much cleaner than if somebody else who thinks they're, you know, good enough to get by um, just kind of throw something in. We, we try to keep everything really collaborative. So if the developers need something, even though a lot of them can write CSS, they come to me or they come to one of the other designers, and then we hand back uh, a complete uh, design. So let's talk about some of the tools. I mean, this is the really cool part of this talk, and this is what I'm the most excited about. Um, some of the tools that we've developed to facilitate this process and to, to help um, polish design uh, be changed quickly when it needs to be changed. So all of our tools are focused on right there, this one big handoff point between designers and developers. Um, and there are three major problems and three major solutions that I want to talk about. Um, number one is a lack of context. So if I'm a de developer, you know, if I'm going to pretend I'm a developer, I get uh, a PSD or I get a static view, I don't necessarily have all the context that I need to understand, like, what's supposed to be happening here? Not only that, but, like, once I've implemented part of it, like where does the old code go? You know, well, there's this whole process of like this Photoshop file has to become this working view and question mark happens in the middle. Um, so what we have is something called the UI directory, um, which is dead simple. It's really just a collection of static views. It originally was a non-functional disposable starting point for views. So views would just kind of, the designer would put them in there, the developer would take that code out, put it into the actual place in the application and toss the file. Um, but what we would find is that we needed that. We needed that reference point because something would happen or somebody, something would change and we wouldn't know where that change happened. It was difficult for the designer to debug um, and all of this other stuff. So what it actually has become now is that it's a representative maintained reference for views. So we actually keep a static reference of every major view in an application in a separate place within the repo. Um, and the UI directory is really just an index file that like lists out all of the other views in that directory under a heading. It's just like a dir.glob call that just lists out all the files. So if I'm a designer, I just make a new static file. I write all my markup. 
and the developer has that as a reference point. Um, so, I mean, uh, here's a zoom in of that, by the way. So this is actually the hash rocket UI directory. So you've got all of these static files just floating out in here. Um, and so how that works here is this is, a, this is part of, there's a slideshow up top, so that's not very interesting, but this is like our client show page of one of our work pieces, and it's full of Latin and, and placeholder images and things like that. Um, I gotta speed it up so I make sure I show you all the cool stuff. Um, so layout bugs with real data is problem number two. So the first problem um, is, w was solved just by uh, maintaining a reference point, and there, there's sort of a secondary problem there, which is, I don't, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are thinking, now all of our view code is doubled. Like, there's all of this static view code and all the real view code. That sounds like a pain. Well, this helps with, uh, with this set, uh, tool helps with both of these things. Like, um, the, w the other problem here that I think is actually much bigger uh, is the layout bugs. So, like, if I'm a designer, I put in, like, John Doe into a slot, and the real application runs, and somebody with a 40-letter last name comes in, and it breaks the layout somewhere. Well, that's really frustrating uh, for everybody. And it, and it is something that's, that it just, we should be focusing on more complicated things. So what, um, what I've written, I, I wrote a Ruby gem, which I'm, I'm super happy about. It'll probably be the only one I ever write. Um, so it's called a, a fill. And what it is, is it's a wrapper for Faker. The, um, it's a data um, mocking library. So it does, it helps with this problem. So I'm a designer, I'm writing all this static view code, I'm pasting in lorem ipsum. It looks super ugly. Um, it's not really what real data will look like, and it doesn't vary enough, so it doesn't really fix the potential problem of like real data behaving more diff differently than whatever arbitrary stuff I've typed in here. So Phil actually um, generates markup for us. So up here, this is actually the code for the vast majority of the client show page I was just showing you. You've got, um, page head nav up there, you've got fill words and you pass it um, ranges. You can just pass an arbitrary range of like one to three words, uh, three to eight words for a subtitle. Um, you've got this walkthrough of um, fly slideshow images that are all different colors. Uh, it just generates co uh, markup um, pulling from um, in a placehold it, I believe. Um, so you get a bunch of placeholder images. Down here, you've got um, everything else you should need, five to 20 words for an H3 one to three paragraphs, you get the idea. There's this nice convenience method that simulates a bunch of body copies, so you can just type in an arbitrary amount of tags and it'll just spit out all those tags. What the developers love about this, well, as a designer, I love this because I don't have to go to lipsum.com and paste in lorem ipsum, um, or you know Samuel L. Ipsum, or whatever your flavor of, of uh, ipsum is. Um, but as a developer, they love it because they can take this and turn it into a working view and have like a very similar structure. So Phil has these me convenience methods like sometimes, sometimes output something one out of every three times. So you can sort of simulate a bunch of different ways that a page might be rendered really quickly. The developer replaces all of those convenience loops with actual loops um, and actual conditionals and things like that. And uh, so it's not that hard to, to um, maintain this stuff because it's, it looks so similar. It's really easy to scan one and then scan the other. And, uh, and honestly, it's worth it. Like if you, it's just like maintaining a test suite. If you maintain, I mean, this is more or less a layout test suite, right? This is a place to, to justify new layout concerns before you're actually dealing with live code. It's a lot easier as a designer to go into here and look at this than it is to make sure that I've run the populate properly, that I have the right type of data to be able to look at the right thing, and when I can just come into the UI directory and make sure that markup looks right. Everyone's life is easier. Makes me happy. Um, so the third uh, tool that I want to talk about is the most recent, um, and it's the biggest problem, and it's something that's been eating at us for forever, which is how do, you, how do I account for states in a UI? And by that I mean um, when, you're, when you're doing like a thick client, like a, we have an Ember app, we have a, a Backbone, that kind of stuff. There are times when like you're doing stuff that only changes a little bit of the page, and as a designer, I don't know what I should be writing for that, because the Ember code is so directly tied to implementation that I can't, it's really kind of impossible to stub out Ember code in a way that makes sense. Um, the old way of stubbing out Ajax calls just results in uh, jQuery spaghetti that we've been trying to avoid. Um, so what do I do? Like, do I do a page and then another page, but that page has like an extra class on this thing that makes it come down? That's a lot of code. Um, so what we've come up with is um, something I wrote called stagehand. Um, so stagehand does this. 
this is a piece of one of our applications. Up here in the corner, do I have a laser pointer? Awesome. Um, so up here in the corner, there's a little icon there. Uh, you click on that, this little guy pops out. Um, and what this is doing is giving you access to a bunch of states of the, of the page. So if I'm looking at this page, I can change the add a report form over here to I don't have it open, to what happens when I click to open it up, to what happens when I have results after a search. It's like an inline search on the page, basically. So I can switch from the no results view right here, you know, so there are no people with the name, you know, uh, to the results view, which actually shows me the results. Um, so I'm not interacting directly with the page, um, I have, but I have this control bar that's showing me all the different states that the designer has prepared for me. So as a developer, you guys understand like all of the different intents, and this also keeps us from missing stuff. Like, have you ever had to go back to a designer to look to like be like, oh, you forgot to design the the error page, or you forgot to put in pagination, or you know all of these different like things that might happen that everyone tends to forget about. Um, the nice thing about uh, stagehand is that the designer can represent all that stuff without actually writing JavaScript. So instead, they just write these data attributes, and this is all read in by stagehand, and that's how that, that sidebar is built out. So they can just say, I have a data stage called add a report, data scene, you know, results, no results, et cetera. Um, that top one is like the container for the other two. Um, and so all of this stuff gets read in by stagehand, and it just hides and shows the appropriate area. Um, so that really helps us. I mean, this, this allows us to react. So those, those are all tools that fit in right here. Like, these are all tools to keep things from going back into pixels. It's to keep from going back into design and to keep everything in the Git repo. So choose the tool that allows you to follow the process that you want. Don't let the tool dictate how you work. On um, this quote from the creative director at Etsy, um, I think it's pretty accurate. And those are our tools. Maybe you guys could come up with other ones. Maybe you could use ours. That would be pretty sweet. But like, just find things that work for you. Um, deliver to communicate. Know your expertise. Facilitate your handoffs. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>